Hello and a happy new year to you all. You're welcome to today's service and a very special welcome to anyone joining us for the first time. We do hope you enjoy the service and we look forward to you joining us again and again and again in the future. 2020 was a very strange year, but God in his mercy saw us through. And now we're in 2021. I believe we are all hoping and praying that 2021 will be by far a better year. Yes, and yes, and yes. I know we are back on lockdown, but I want to encourage everyone to put their trust in God. Trust that he will yet again guide us and we will not be overwhelmed. Psalm 48 verse 14 NIV version says, For this God is our God forever and ever. He will be our guide even to the end. Let us draw our strength from God. Do not allow the news you hear all around you weigh you down. Be strong, be of good courage, do not be afraid. The Lord will go before thee. He will not fail thee and he will not forsake thee. Deuteronomy 31 verse 6. That means that God is standing right by our side. We are not alone. Let us put our focus on him. Because the Bible says in Isaiah 26 3, I will keep in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on the Lord. And my personal favorite, I've been using it so far this year to encourage myself. Psalm 139 verse 5, TPT version. It says, you've gone into my future to prepare the way. And in kindness, you follow behind me to spare me from the harm of my past. With your hand of love upon my life, you impart a blessing to me. That means that God is interested in us. He will go ahead of us to make sure that all things work together for our good. Everything will be all right. Simply trust in God. Just like David did when he was distressed in 1 Samuel 36. He was distressed and he encouraged himself in the Lord. Everyone encourage yourself in the Lord whenever you feel overwhelmed or whenever you feel distressed. And the Lord will see us through this year. Shall we pray? Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. King of glory, King of kings, and Lord of lords and Prince of peace. We honor you, we adore you, we magnify your holy name. We exalt you for you are God. Thank you, God. Lord, we come before you this morning and we ask that your will be done in our lives. Let your kingdom come upon our lives, come upon our family, our church, and our community. Father, you that supply all our needs according to your riches and glory, we ask that this morning, O oh Lord, you give us our daily bread. Anyone that needs healing, the Bible says healing is the children's daily bread. That, Father, you provide healing, comfort, peace, and strength to each and every one of us, meeting us at the point of our needs. And we come before you humbly asking that you have mercy on us, O Lord. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us, as we learn to forgive those who trespass against us. Lord, have mercy upon us. Lord, forgive us for all that we have done in everywhere we've fallen short of the glory of the Lord. And we come before you this morning, O Lord. We ask, O Lord, that you lead us not into temptation, but you deliver us from evil. Father, Go before us. Guide our footsteps. As the Bible says that the footsteps of the righteous is ordered by the Lord. That you will guide us and lead us that we do not walk into trouble in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. That Father God Almighty, you will protect us. That the sun does not smite us by day, neither the moon by night. You preserve our soul and you keep us from every form of evil. Father, we commit the service unto your hand. That as we hear the word that will be coming, that we will gain something from it that the world will not go back void it will accomplish that that is set for to do that we will gain something and that we will use it to run by this week this month and even this year and thine is the kingdom the power and the glory we recognize that all power belongs to you and we respect that forever and ever we honor you because you were God and beside you there is no other God thank you thank you Lord we appreciate you blessed be your holy name on high in Jesus name amen now enjoy the rest of the service and we look forward to the series coming the new series coming in pursuit 
God bless you and enjoy the rest of the service. reading is taken from Psalm 3. Lord, how many are my foes? How many rise up against me? Many are saying of me, God will not deliver him. But you, Lord, are a shield around me. My glory the one who lifts my head high. I call out to the Lord, and he answers me from his holy mountain. I lie down and sleep. 
I awake again because the Lord sustains me. I will not fear though tens of thousands assail me on every side. Arise, Lord, deliver me, my God. Strike all my enemies on the jaw. Break the teeth of the wicked. From the Lord comes deliverance. May your blessing be on your people. friends and uh, welcome to TFW Online Church. So glad you could join us today uh, for this online service. And as you as you probably know by now, uh, we took the decision uh, as elders um, earlier last week to suspend our in-person services for the time being. We just felt that with the whole situation with uh, coronavirus and the infection numbers going up nationally and even locally, we just felt that the responsible thing to do was just to hit the pause button for a while on our in-person services, um, just out of an abundance of caution to protect people. And we hope you understand the reasons uh, that we did that. Um, as soon as we see infection numbers coming down again, 
Uh, we'll be constantly looking at it, monitoring it, reviewing the situation, and we'll let you know when we feel uh, that it's the, the right thing to do to open up in-person services again. So stay prayerful. And, you know, I just wanted to bring a, uh, an encouragement to you before we get into the, the sermon today, um, just to keep your eyes on Jesus during this season that we're in. Uh, every day the, the, the news headlines are uh, scary and worrying, perhaps. Um, and, and, and we understand all of the reasons for that. But, you know, as Christians, our hope is always in the sovereignty of our God. We, we trust in him. We look to him. And we believe that he's the one who watches over us. He's the one who protects us. And we actually believe that our lives are in his hands. And so I'm not minimizing in any way the seriousness of, of the coronavirus situation, but just an encouragement to each one of us to, to keep our eyes on the Lord. Because this, is, this hasn't taken him by surprise. He, he knew this was coming. And we, we want to pray for our nation. This is a time for us as Christians to shine the light into the darkness. Pray for our nation. Pray for protection for people. Pray for our NHS. Pray for the government, and those who lead. And also just pray that we could share the, the reasons for the hope that we have with the world around us, especially, especially now. But if you're struggling in any way with worry or anxiety and you just need somebody to pray with you, um, then do reach out to somebody. You can reach out to any of the elders. Our contact information uh, is regularly made available, so you should have that. Uh, or reach out to your small group leader or just a friend and say, hey, I'm just feeling a little anxious today, a little worried. Could you pray for me? Because as we support each other and encourage each other, as we keep our eyes fixed on God, then we come through these, uh, these testing seasons in our lives. Today, we're starting a, a brand new series and we're calling this series In Pursuit. In Pursuit. And the first uh, subtitle, if you want, of this series today is Friendship with God. In Pursuit, Friendship with God. If you walk onto any primary school playground, anywhere in the country, probably anywhere in the world, you'll see a game being played, which is about as simple uh, as games get. We call it tag or tig, depending which part of the country you come from. And you know the idea, right? You, you chase people. <laughs> you chase other kids around the playground trying to tag them. And then they're it. And then their job is to, to chase the other kids. I remember playing tag so often when I was a kid. Just that game of chasing others. And of course, there was the more risque version, which was Kiss Chase. How many of you ever played Kiss Chase? That was for the advanced uh, chasers. And when you when you caught somebody, you didn't just tag them, you kissed them. Um, we sort of grew out of that one as we got older, didn't we? But our new series is called In Pursuit. And I just, I wonder, what is it that you're pursuing in life? What are you chasing? What are you going after? What is it that you are chasing down in this life? Because uh, there could be so many different answers to that question. The Christian life is, in many ways, a pursuit where we go after. We, we even chase a deeper, healthier, more Christ-centered life where we pursue God himself. And so in the next few, few weeks, we're going to look at what it means uh, and how we can live a more integrated life, chasing a closer relationship with Jesus. I think that's really what all of us are looking for. We, we want meaning and purpose and, and we want intimacy with God. And we're going to look over this next few weeks at how we chase that, how we go after that. Now, why is this important? It's important for a number of, of reasons. But one of the reasons is that you and I become like whatever it is that we pursue. We become like the things we pursue. So you want to make sure you're pursuing the right thing. Um, again, over Christmas, I, I talked about it just a few weeks ago. Uh, Scrooge, you know, one of those uh, classic Christmas characters. But Scrooge is a great example of someone who his pursuit in life, 
what he chased, what he went after more than anything else was money. That's what he chased. That's what he went after. Uh, and he didn't care what it cost him. He didn't care what relationships suffered. He didn't care who he had to climb over or hurt or offend. That was his goal. That was his God. That was his idol. And we all have to guard our hearts uh, in this area because whatever you pursue, you become like. If money is your, your God, if you pursue money is the most important thing in your life, then you're going to become greedy. You're going to become materialistic. You're going to become less generous as a person. If you are pursuing success, if success is the most important thing to you, then you will sacrifice relationships. You'll, you'll, you'll sacrifice your health. You'll throw your work colleagues under the bus, so to speak. You'll do whatever it takes in order to get to that place that you consider to be successful. Or maybe the most important thing in your life, the thing you're going after is your re reputation. That's what matters more to you than anything else, what other people think of you. And if, if that's what you're chasing in life, if that's what you're pursuing, then you can become defensive. Uh, you don't take criticism well. You become fearful of what other people think of you. This goes on and on and on and on. And so many of us can find ourselves, all of us can find ourselves pursuing different things, putting our energy and our drive and our focus into things that we are chasing in life. And so you and I have to do, I think at the start of 2021, uh, uh, take, a, take stock, do a little inventory uh, and ask ourselves, what is it that we've been really chasing in this life? What might you have been pursuing a little bit too much? I, uh, years ago, a number of years ago, I was speaking at a church in Northern Ireland and on a Sunday morning, and I was with a friend of mine called Thomas McLean. Uh, and Thomas and I were almost the last people to leave the church that morning. It's one of the things about being in traveling ministry. You're always the first to arrive and the last to leave. And finally, a very nice gentleman said to us, uh, you're coming back to our house for lunch. Um, and you can come and have lunch, rest at our house before you go to your evening service in a different church. And so we, we got into our team van and the guy was driving a blue Volkswagen Passat and he got into his car and he said, just follow me. It was great. So we, we followed him out of the church car park and through this little town. And, uh, and Thomas and I were talking away, as you do, about the service, what had gone well and so on and, and what we might want to do in the evening service. And we're sort of chatting away following the blue Passat. And we followed and we followed and we followed and we followed and five minutes became 10 minutes, which became 15 minutes. And that's not particularly unusual, you know, in, in Northern Ireland, people drive sometimes a, a little way to get to the church they go to, but then it became 20 minutes and 25 minutes and 30 minutes, 35 minutes, 40 minutes. And we started thinking, hang on, where does this guy live? As, as we finally drove through a, a little area, we, we realized we'd crossed over the border. We were no longer in Northern Ireland. We were now in the Republic of Ireland. And as we came up to a, a little crossroads, a little junction, uh, we, we got close enough to the Volkswagen Passat, the blue Volkswagen Passat. And I said to Thomas, you know that guy we were following, Tom? Did he have a lady in the car with him? Thomas said, no, I don't think so. I said, well, the car I'm following has got a lady with a man in front and we suddenly realized we had been following the wrong car not just for a minute or two for 35 40 minutes we've been following the wrong car pursuing the wrong vehicle i won't bore you with the details but we had to find our way back to the town that we'd left and we had to phone people and people phoned around and got us in touch with the this person we were supposed to be at his house for lunch and and instead of getting to his house for one o'clock for lunch, we got there about three o'clock. Very embarrassed. And they were very gracious. But you see, what happened there is that we, uh, we Thomas and I weren't bad people. We just took our eye off the ball. What had actually happened, we think, is we'd gone around a, a roundabout 
and, and as we'd gone around that roundabout, the guy we'd been following had turned off a different exit and another identical car had, had come onto the roundabout and I just followed the wrong one. I just took my eye off the ball. I just missed who it was I should have been following, who, who it was I should have been pursuing. And I think that's how we get ourselves a little bit lost in this life. It's not that we're terribly wicked and evil people. We just get our eye off the ball. We just start pursuing the wrong things, almost accidentally. And the danger is, is that you turn around one day in your life and you, you realize you're not where you ought to have been. You've gotten quite far off track simply because you've not been pursuing the right thing. And so today, and in this series, we're going to talk about some of our pursuits and some of the very practical ways that we can pursue a, a, a closer walk with, with God. And I want to talk about pursuing a friendship with God. A friendship with God. Of all the things you and I could pursue in this life, I think this is, this is one of those that will bring you and I real life, real purpose, real meaning. You know, no other religion offers this idea. No other religion offers the idea that a person could be a friend of God or of whatever deity uh, that religion believes in. It's unique to the Judeo-Christian idea that a human being is not just a, a subject of God, is not just the creation of God, but we can actually be friends with God. It's a radical, radical idea. And you find it in the scriptures right at the very beginning. We see Adam and Eve. And Adam and Eve are, are the, the pinnacle of God's creation. He's made the universe. He's made the heavens and the earth. He's filled it with plant life and animal life. And now he creates people. But they're not like the animal life. People are, are made in God's image. And that's the first clue to how you and I can have a relationship with God is because we are not like the animals. We are made uniquely in his image. It's one of the reasons we should always love and show respect to all people because every single person, whether they are a believer or not, they are made in the image of God. They carry his image. They bear his image. And there's this beautiful picture in the book of Genesis where it says that in the, at the end of the day, in the cool of the evening, God would, God would descend. He would come down. He would walk with Adam and Eve in the cool of the day. He would be their friend. They had a friendship relationship. And we know that all of that went wrong when Adam and Eve chose to disobey their God. They chose to disobey their friend. They threw away that intimate, close relationship and sin entered not only their own hearts and lives, but the whole of creation fell when Adam and Eve fell. But then there's this beautiful passage in, in Exodus chapter 33 uh, talking about Moses. Moses is, if you're new to Christianity, is a name you might have heard of. You might be familiar with the name of Moses. He was a guy that God had raised up to lead the children of Israel, out of captivity and into the promised land. And he's, he's talked about a lot, this guy Moses, and he was a great leader. But in, Mo, in Exodus chapter 33, there's this wonderful passage about how Moses, Moses would go into this tent, and it was called the tent of meeting. It's where he would go to pray. And just listen to what it says. Now Moses used to take the tent and pitch it outside the camp, far off from the camp, and he called it the tent of meeting. And everyone who sought the Lord would go out to the tent of meeting, which was outside the camp. Whenever Moses went out to the tent, all the people would rise up, and each would stand at his tent door and watch Moses until he'd gone into the tent. When Moses entered the tent, the pillar of cloud would descend and stand at the entrance of the tent, and the Lord would speak with Moses. And when all the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance of the tent, all the people would rise up and worship each at his tent door. Thus the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face 
as a man speaks to his friend. When Moses turned again into the camp, his assistant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, would not depart from the tent. It's a beautiful, beautiful passage of scripture. Uh, and, and we see here that this mysterious thing that somehow as Moses went into that tent of meeting to, to pray, to seek God, there was this descending of God's presence. This descending of God's presence. Uh, and it says there that Moses would, uh, the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face. Now, I, I'm not sure that, that God um, appeared in a physical way. But I think that the scriptures here are just giving us some sort of metaphorical language that of Moses coming into God's presence. And it was just like he was right there with God speaking face to face. But the thing that thrills me and, and, and blows me away is this bit that he says he would speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. I mean, if you are reading that. If you're studying the scripture and you're reading those verses and it said, um, and the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face as God would speak to his creation. You would say, well, that, that doesn't seem out of place. That's, that seems right. He's God. We're his creation. He speaks as God speaks to his creation. Or, or, or maybe if it said, um, the Lord spoke to Moses face to face as a, as a commander speaks to his servant. That wouldn't seem out of place either. You'd say, well, okay, yeah, God's the commander, we're his servant. Or, or, or if it said uh, that he spoke to Moses face to face as a father speaks to his child. You'd say, well, that's, that's intimate, that's beautiful. But, and that would make sense too. But it, it's even better than that, isn't it? Moses, he would speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. Wow. Have you thought just what that means? That you and I could have a, a relationship with God where we are his friends. We're not just his creation. We're not just his servants. We're not even only his children, although all of those things are true. But we have the opportunity to be his friends. It's a beautiful thing. And I, I hope you get captured today with the wonder of that idea again, that this year in 2021, you would pursue a friendship with God. And you might say, well, Steve, that was Moses and that was in the Old Testament. But this idea is, is carried over into the New Testament, into the, into the New Covenant. And, and you find here in, in the Gospels, in, in John chapter 15, one of my favorite chapters of, of, of uh, the scriptures, John chapter 15. This is what Jesus is, uh, says to his disciples, those that he'd called to follow him. From verse 12, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends. If you do what I command you, no longer do I call you servants. For a servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all that I have heard from my father, I have made known to you. Jesus is talking here to his disciples and he's saying, listen, you're not just my servants. You are my friends friends. The first thing he says in that little passage is that it's this thing, this relationship thing is all about love. He says, this is my commandment that you love one another as I've loved you. I've loved you. Now I want you to love each other. Christianity is, is so much about love, letting love grow and blossom in our lives amongst ourselves, but also between us and God. He says, this thing is about love. And then he says, listen, I don't call you servants. I, I, I call you my friends. You know, of course, in one sense, they are still his servants, right? We are Jesus' servants in the sense that we want to honor and serve him. That's a great image. But, you know, we are more than just his servants. We are his 
friends. And then he says, listen, I, I still want you to obey my commands because friendship with the Lord necessitates an attitude in our hearts where we are willing to do what he's asked us, commands us even to do. What was it that messed up the relationship between Adam and Eve and God in the first place? What was it that broke that friendship? It was their refusal to walk in obedience to God. And now Jesus is saying, listen, as a sign of our friendship, because of our love, I want you to obey me. Obey me because you're my friend. Don't do it. You know, obey me and serve me as a servant with no love involved, but do it as a friend, out of a heart of love, with our friendship front and center. You know, there are many people who try to live the Christian life as a servant and only as a servant. In other words, I'm going to do the things that God says we should do. But there's no sense of actually walking with God with love. And so people end up trying to live the Christian life out of, out of duty, just like a servant. And that's not necessary. You don't have to love your master in order to be a servant. You can just be doing your job, doing your duty. And if we're not careful, if, we, if we're not pursuing friendship with God, we get our eye off the ball, we can find ourselves doing all the Christian things, but not from a heart of love and friendship, but from a heart of duty and service. And when, when that happens, Christianity gets really, really difficult. For instance, when it comes to resisting temptation, uh, you are much more successful at resisting temptation if you think of God as your friend. And if that's your motivation, I, I, I want to resist temptation because I don't want to hurt my friend. I don't want to offend the one I love. I want to honor him. I want to obey him. And that's my motivation for resisting temptation. Then you, you're going to be much more successful at resisting temptation. But if your motivation for resisting temptation is, well, listen, um, I better not sin because if I do, God won't bless me. You know, if I sin, I offend him and then he, you know, he won't give me health. He won't answer my prayers. Um, perhaps if I sin, I, I might get caught. It's sin in sin, and then my reputation will be ruined. Uh, whatever will people think of me? Or, or even if I sin, if I do this thing, then I'm going to feel bad about myself tomorrow. Um, you notice what's pr the problem with all of those motivations? They're all selfish, actually. They're all about me. God's not going to bless me. My reputation's going to be ruined. I'm going to feel bad about myself. Therefore, I won't sin. That's a, a, a selfish set of reasons for, for resisting temptation. But when I say I'm tempted in whatever way you're tempted, and we're all tempted, I'm tempted. But you know what? I, I don't want to destroy my friendship with God. I don't want to hurt God. I don't want to hurt the heart of the one I love. And actually, my reason for obeying him is him and the friendship I have with him. Um, and that's what you and I have to do. So three things. The first thing is this. Uh, if we want to pursue a, a deep friendship with God, number one, you have to believe that friendship with God is possible. You've got to believe it. In fact, you have to believe that God is your friend, that he wants to be your friend. Now, this might not be uh, earth-shattering news for some of you that are listening to this today. You might be very comfortable with that idea. But I understand that for some of you listening to this, that is not how you have seen God over the years. When you've thought about God, you've thought about him as big and powerful, maybe scary. You've thought about him as uh, austere. You've thought about him as mysterious, but the last thing you've thought about him as really is your friend. And if you want to develop a friendship with God, then just believing that is huge. If you believe that he's your friend, uh, that he invites you into a warm friendship, it affects your feelings, it affects your mood, it even affects your awareness of him on a day-to-day, hour-by-hour 
basis. I guess what we're talking about there is faith, not fear. You know, when the Bible talks about fear, it refers to fear in two different ways. One of the ways it talks about fear uh, is in us being afraid. We're scared. We're terrified, um, even of God. Uh, and so, for instance, the Bible says, perfect love casts out all fear. Isn't that beautiful? If you want to have a warm friendship with God, and you believe that that's possible, then you need to know that you don't have to be afraid of God. Uh, perfect love casts out that kind of fear. But there's another kind of fear that the Bible talks about, uh, where it says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of, of wisdom. It even refers to friendship with God comes because of our fear for him. Um, but that word fear is actually talking about honor, respect. It's, it's, it's about, um, put it this way. Um, if you get into a powerful car like a, a Ferrari and you're going to drive it, it might be good and it might be great fun even. But you've got to have a healthy respect, a healthy fear even for what it is you're, you're in the driver's seat of. Um, approaching God is like approaching a thousand nuclear power stations. Um, you've got to have some healthy respect and awe for, for who he is. Uh, four or five years ago, I, I was in Norway, a friend of mine called Bo, we, we went there to, to speak at a couple of youth events and, and to speak at, at a church. And one of the guys who works in the church there is now a friend of mine. And he took us, he works on the oil, uh, oil rigs in the North Sea. And he took us to um, a, a place where his company were constructing a brand new oil rig. And it was nearly finished. And he got permission for us to go on site. We had to wear all the safety gear. And he gave us a tour of the oil rig. And we went around the outside and then up into the inside. And that thing was, I can only describe it as awe-inspiring. It was just, it was just huge. And here's the thing I became aware of as I walked around this oil rig with all of the parts and all of the engineering complexity. And he took us into the control room with all these computer screens everywhere. Uh, and I suddenly realized how little I knew. I felt really small compared to that oil rig. That's the sort of fear that the Bible's talking about as we approach our Heavenly Father, as we approach our God, just knowing that he, he sees more than we see, he knows more than we know, he's bigger and stronger, he's awe-inspiring to us. And when you've got that kind of respect, that kind of fear for him, and you know that he's your friend, Wow, you, you want to love him, you want to honor him, you want to obey him. And it becomes a privilege just to get out of bed every day and go, God, you are my friend and you invite me to be your friend. So we want to approach God with that kind of faith, not fear, faith that says, God, you are a friend, even a friend to sinners like me. The second thing you and I could do is, and this is really important, I think, is get rid of the distractions in life. In other words, not go after the wrong pursuits, not pursue the wrong things. I guess another way of saying that is, is, is repent, is repent. It's just as we take inventories, we take stock of our lives. To sometimes just stop and say, Lord, where I've got distracted, where I've been pursuing the wrong things, thinking that they would bring me life. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You know, in fact, the Bible tells us that you can't be friends with God and friends with the world uh, at the same time. James chapter 4, um, it's, a, it's a challenging uh, chapter, uh, challenging verses. It, it starts off asking this question, what causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Um, just think about that in context of Jesus' words to his disciples, to love one another, you know, walk in love. And here James is, is talking to Christians in a church saying, what is it that causes quarrels and fights among you? 
Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. You adulterous people. I mean, strong words there from James to, to the people he's writing to. He says, you're, you, you adulterous people. You know what adultery is, right? It means you're having an affair. And that's one of the uh, metaphors. It's, it's, it's one of the images that the scriptures gives us of when we um, turn away from God and we have this passion and pursuit of the things of the world. Uh, the Bible uses this image of adultery. It's like we're committing adultery against God. He says, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you suppose it is no, to no purpose that the scripture says he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us? I got a great email uh, this last year, a few months ago, from someone on behalf of their small group because they've been having a conversation about the word sanctification and what does that mean? And you know, our, you might know the word sanctification means to be set apart. And they said, aren't, aren't we just sanctified when we come to faith in, in Christ? And so I emailed back and I said, well, yeah, yes, in one sense we are. But sanctification in the Christian life has always been understood as an ongoing process. In other words, there are layers of change that take place in our lives. Uh, if you want to change deeply as a person, if you want to become closer and closer to God in your friendship with him, uh, you're going to have to get used to saying sorry to God a lot. Um, in case you hadn't thought of this, God's never going to have to say sorry to you. But you and I are going to have to say sorry to him a lot because there are layers of change that have to take place in our lives as we're being sanctified. And that's, that's okay. That's okay. Um, listen to what he, he says here. This is encouraging. Uh, after it says that he's, he yearns jealously for us, it says, but he gives more grace. Don't you love the word grace? Uh, at TFW, we talk about uh, having great big dollops of grace. If, if you didn't know, uh, a dollop is a theological term. It's a, it's a, it's a measure of grace. Uh, and we have to have, I'm, I'm just playing with you, but uh, we have to have great big dollops of grace for each other and even for ourselves. And God offers us as much grace as we ever need. Um, Listen, this, is, this message today is not a, uh, intended to be a guilt trip. Um, it's not intended to make you feel bad. It's intended to encourage you to sort out some of those priorities and get rid of some of those distractions, those things that you're pursuing to the wrong destination. Um, the third thing, the final thing I, would, I just want to say uh, today is that to pursue friendship with God, we have to pursue friendship with him as a priority. It's got to be a priority in our lives. You, you're not going to have an accidental friendship with God. You're not going to accidentally uh, grow closer to him. And we're going to talk more about this in the weeks to come, about how we can pursue that closeness with God and how we can get there. But... I want to ask you today, will you make this a priority in your life in 2021? Will you set your life up this year that your friendship with God is your priority? It goes on to say here in James 4 verse 8, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Just like Moses, all those centuries before, where he would make that time to go into the tent of meeting so that he could talk to his friend, the living God. Will you do that? Will you spend time each day this year drawing near to God, making your priority your friendship with him?
Jesus said this. It's a, this is one of those verses that I've always found really challenging in life. It's Luke 9, 23. And Jesus said this, if anyone wants to come after me, in other words, if anyone wants to pursue me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. Deny yourself, take up your cross daily and follow me. But you know, the thing that strikes me is that the first word uh, in that verse is the word if, if anyone wants to come after me, if anyone wants to pursue me. You know, sometimes I think that us Western Christians, we can be very comfortable in our in our Christianity, in our religiousness. And we really need to challenge ourselves at times, or at least be challenged by the Holy Spirit about whether we really want this kind of life with God or not. Do we really want to pursue Jesus? Um, or do you just want a slice of Christian pie every so often? See, I, 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 I think there are some people who really what they want is a bit of religion on the side. And then they just want to live the rest of their life the same as everybody else. And sure, maybe I'll, I'll do church on Sunday and maybe it'd be good if God would be there for me when I need him. And it'd be good if, you know, if, he, would, if he would meet my needs when I've got a need that, that, that needs meeting. But, but really, I, I wouldn't want God to take over too much. I, I really want to live my life the same as everybody else. And, and, and that's not really the life that Jesus offers. He says, no, if you want to come after me, Deny yourself. Take up your cross daily and follow after me. You know, I've been in leadership. Uh, I, I might not be that old, but I've, I've been in leadership for getting towards 29 years uh, uh, this year. And uh, one of the things I've noticed in my leadership in church uh, life from when I was a, a youth leader right through to now being a, a lead pastor is that as leaders, we spend so much of our time and energy trying to motivate people. You know, come on, you know, we, you know, it's really important that you pray and it's really important that you spend time in the, in the Word and maybe get a couple of good books and, and read them and, and, and get involved and plug in and, and, and make worship a priority. And we spend so much time trying to motivate people and often we have depressingly bad results. And I've come to the conclusion that for some people, for some people, they really don't want to do those things, no matter how much a leader encourages them to. If you've been a Christian for any length of time now, and again, I'm, I, I, this is not a guilt trip. I'm just having an honest conversation with you this morning. If you've been a Christian for any length of time and you still don't really pray regularly and you don't really read the Bible and you, you, know, you, you have this kind of take it or leave it attitude, then... I wonder how much any leader could ever do for you unless you get a revelation, unless you personally get a conviction that you want to have a friendship with God. Um, listen, I recognize that for a lot of, of us, including me, we look at our lives and we think, I'm not very good at this. I really do want to have a relationship with God. I'm just not very good at it. Join the club. That's back to our, our illustration about grace, great big dollops of grace. He gives us the grace we need to be friends with him. And I don't want you to, to listen or to go away from this message today and, and say, oh, wow, you know, it's all up to me. I, I've got to read more. I've got to pray more. I've got to read my Bible more. I've got to be better so that I can be a friend with, with God. No, 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 no. I'm just, I'm not saying that. Don't take that from this message Walk in grace, take a breath, believe that he loves you, believe that he's your friend and that he's available to you. And just make that little change. You know, Thomas and I, when we were following the blue Volkswagen Passat that day, if we just paid a little more attention, we didn't have to do a, a huge change, just paid a little more attention. Just just followed the right car at the right moment, we would have had a totally different outcome. And I think that's often the way it is with our, with our faith. Um, sometimes we just need to pay a little bit more attention 
on a daily basis to our friendship with God. And uh, you, this year, you can, you can learn to have a deeper walk with him. You can learn better rhythms and disciplines and beliefs that will help you develop a fresher, warmer, deeper, more life-giving friendship with God. As we come to the end, we're going to pray. And um, if that's what you want, I, I invite you to pray with me. And whether you are a seasoned veteran, you've been in a church for a long time, been a Christian a long time, or whether you're brand new to the Christian faith, I want you to pray with me today that you would develop this year uh, a warmer, deeper friendship with, with Jesus. Because he's made the way. He's made the way for us to have that. It's not about... Uh, us trying harder. He came, Jesus came. He lived the perfect life that we could not live. And he died the sacrificial death in our place that we could not do for ourselves. He did all of that. He did all the heavy lifting in order for us to have a friendship with him. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for those that have tuned into this message today and as we've thought about and talked about what it means to be your friend and for you to be our friend, God, it's an amazing thing that you, the God of all creation, you invite us into a friendship with you. Oh God, help us to get a deeper revelation of that today and help us to pursue that, to make that our number one pursuit this year a deeper, closer friendship with you. And may we see the knock-on effect of that, that played out in every area of our lives. I pray for anyone today who just wants to say to you right now, Lord, I'm sorry, I've been pursuing the wrong things. Please forgive me. Uh, and even right now in this moment of prayer, they would just feel that release in, in their inner world as they come back to just pursuing you, pursuing the right thing. Lord, I pray you bless everyone uh, this week uh, as, we, as we live our life, God. We know we're in this difficult season, but we know that you have got us in your hands. We're in, you, you are in control. And I pray that you would help us just to have a confidence in you as we head into this new week, God. Help us to live with lightness in our hearts, rejoicing in our hearts. Help us to live our lives in a way that we shine as lights in the darkness. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, thanks as always for listening, friends, for tuning in. Uh, if you've got any needs whatsoever, reach out to us. Uh, you know uh, we're always here for you and we'll do whatever we can. And let's, let's shine his lights in the darkness and we'll see you again next week.